Hello and welcome to episode 282 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans Weekly Podcast of Many Topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and if you're looking at the episode description or episode title, you know what you're getting in for. This is part three of our Final Fantasy XIV miniseries. We're going to talk all about Stormblood and all about the personal journeys of a new panel. So let's introduce that panel, starting with Eva Padilla. Yo... And also, making his triumphant return to the podcast since a Final fan no, Fantasy Star, for discussion from last fall, Mark Chan. Hey, how's it going? It's going alright. I could not resist mentioning Fantasy Star without accidentally calling it Final Fantasy Star again. <laughs> is, um, it, is it spelled with a PH? Uh, Two yes. Of them. But this time we're at, we're actually talking about the thing I kept accidentally calling Fantasy Star several months ago. We are in Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy fourteen, that is, Final Fantasy fourteen Stormblood, that is. Stormblood is the twenty seventeen expansion to Final Fantasy fourteen, uh where the players journey to Gear Abania in the north section of Eorzea, and also to a few regions in the far east of the world of Final Fantasy fourteen. So maybe surprisingly, maybe not, borrowing from the real life far east of the world. Uh, Stormblood is, I, 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 it, it's, um, it's about revolution, about rebellion, and about, uh, visiting new parts of the Final Fantasy XIV world. Um, but let's, before we get into the real specifics of Stormblood, let's talk about ourselves a little bit, because we wouldn't be podcasters without being a little self-indulgent. That was a dig at myself, not not really of YouTube, but I, I, I promise. No, no, no. It's, it's cool. It's cool. I indulge. It's cool. <laughs> All right. But speaking of indulging in Eva, uh, Eva, tell me, tell us a little bit about your individual Final Fantasy fourteen journey. So I started on fourteen um, at the tail end of February twenty twenty. Now you might be thinking, huh? That seems like a strangely opportune time to get into an MMO, and uh, you'd be right. Um, so I started on it then, and uh, then uh, you know the COVID lockdown happened in the U.S., and I was like, "Well, I guess I'm just I'm in this. I'm fully in this." Um, and this came after I basically played um, a bunch of Final Fantasies all in uh, the span of a year, having never finished one before. Um, so I've been. On and off with the game uh, since then, and I am currently about halfway through the Shadowbringers uh, main scenario quest. That's right. I remember when you and I first met and started podcasting together was, I don't know, uh, middle of 2019 or so. You were in the midst of trying to play most or all of the Final Fantasies. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I was in a way proud of you because I, I knew you were, you were much newer to RPGs in general to, compared to me who's been playing them for 25 years, but also a little aghast that you were playing it like FF6 for the first time when, <laughs> around when we started talking. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was, you know, when I got hired to the site, um, I, someone asked about, um, you know, Chrono Trigger versus FF6. And I was like, haha, I'm currently just starting Chrono Trigger and I finished FF6 like three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Chrono Trigger and FF6, two episodes, two, uh, games that we have podcasted about here on Retro Encounter somewhat in the past, uh, m- before Eva was born, I, I guess. <gasps> um, <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, look you're, you, until I podcast with you, you're dead to me. So you, you, as, as far as I'm concerned, you were born in 2019. Ouch! <laughs> hey, at least at least I'm alive now, you know? Hmm? And uh, and let's live in the present. Um, but actually, no, let's live in the past a little bit. Uh, uh, listeners, you may be, have heard me mention this in previous episodes, but I uh, started playing FF14 in 2016 when uh, most of the FF14 world was engrossed in the Heavensward post game. I binged it really hard for like six months and then took a break for about two years, then binged it really hard again in early 2019, um, playing through, and that's when I played through Stormblood for the first time, sort of in the, eh, like, like middle of 2019, I, I finished Hems- uh, Heavensward and Stormblood back to back, then took another break, and then in 2020, during, uh, um, during pandemic times, I caught up and, uh, played through Shadowbringers, and I'm currently in the middle of another break, uh, I have not played FF14 since, Oh, I don't know. I think since last summer sometime. And, uh, but with, uh, 
um, Endwalker coming up and hype building up for that expansion. It's only a matter of time before I relapse back into the world of FF14. Um, I, it has not happened yet. Uh, maybe I have, to, I should finish another podcast game first. <laughs> um, but we're, we're not into end of episode housekeeping yet. But I, uh, the, I am currently away from FF14, but I will get back to it probably soon. But, uh, speaking of people getting back to FF14 after a break, um, Mark, I know, uh, that you are, uh, that you have gotten deep into FF14 and definitely have, uh, have at least cleared through Stormblood, but uh, we're on a break for at least a while. Um, what's your FF14 journey been like? Okay, so, um, FF14, I started, uh, years and years ago and then decided, um, I didn't really like the server I was on or the people I was playing with and th- I came back to RPG fan and started over. So then I did, a very quick run from the beginning of 2.0 content up to the end of Stormblood, kind of in the space of a of a few months. And as a result, my memory of Stormblood is extremely blurred with my memory of Heavensward, with my memory of 2.0. Um, and then immediately after, I got into Shadow... Like, I had a break, and then I got into Shadowbringers. And then I went on break again and came back very recently. So it's sort of been a little bit of time for me between like um, now and when I finished Stormblood, which I've had to go back and recap for, for myself. And Eva's actually helped me like study up a little bit and refresh my memory of <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that that wasn't Stormblood. That was Heaven's Word. <laughs> it's like, oh, right. But Astinia is in Stormblood, right? Yeah, for like five seconds. Yeah, that was a good call because there will be a test at the end of the episode. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. N- now I've now I've cleared Shadowbringers, um, and I'm just waiting on patch five point five or whatever it is coming up, and um, going back to Stormblood content uh, and doing like some some revisiting actually has been really cool. Um, I I kind of like glossed and forgotten just like how cool both uh, Yotsuyu and Fordola's stories are, so I'm I'm looking forward to like uh, talking about them today. Those two are, I, I think each of them is a very worthy discussion within uh, within Stormblood. Um, uh, Fordola and Yotsuyu, sort of secondary antagonists and uh, very important NPCs uh, through Stormblood and its post game content. Uh, each of them practically has a post game patch dedicated to them and so it's 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 a uh, it's unusual how they structured it but but before we get to the post game patch let's go to the what the um body of stormblood is like uh stormblood starts out um with you uh dealing with or at least re uh re encountering the uh, gear, the Alamigo refu- refugee crisis. All the way back in 2.0 and the post game 2.0 content, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you meet people from Alamigo, which is a state to sort of the north northeast of the where the bulk of the activity in FF14 happens. And it's a uh, it's it's, an, it's a nation that had fallen to the Garlean Empire uh, something like 15 or 20 years before the events of FF14 main storyline. And you uh, there's a lot of refugees from Alamigo all over the uh, FF14 world. Most of them are in the Ulda area, but there's, but they're all over the world. It's, um, I, I think it's a, a primarily a nation of, of hewers, of, uh, of the, the human like, um, uh, the, the, the human like peoples of FF14, but it, but, uh, it has a, I, I mean, the look and feel of Alamigo is s- sort of like, it, it's like elaborate temples, highlands, uh, you could reasonably compare it to, uh, uh, to Tibet, I think, if you were to attach it to a specific, um, uh, to, to a specific real world place. Uh, am I, am I being unfair here? Uh, I feel like, I feel like if, if we're talking about like Alamigo specifically, there definitely is like a bit of Tibetan, but I would almost say like there's some Afghanistan in there. There's, there's a feeling of like, like Afghan, um, uh, not planes exactly, but like uh, like, like like the Central Asian Steppe, sort of. Yeah, Central Asian Steppe, a little the, the, near the, the, east the, as well. The Azim Steppe is extremely Central Asian Steppe. <laughs> yeah, but the, I mean, uh, that, that's just straight up Mo- Mongolia. That's, yeah, but I, I, I was <laughs> I was thinking more about like the architecture of the temples of uh, of Alamigo and um, true, yeah, and yeah. and such. But but the, uh, the the gist of it is this is an uh, a, a nation that's sort of in the highlands of the uh, of the 
Eorzean continent. There's a land bridge between uh, uh, Garibania, where Alamigo is, and the next continent over, which is why it was very uh, strategically important to the invading Garleans. Um, uh, but and, and and their architecture is sort of uh, is uh, is elaborate temples. Um, the 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 order of monks that the monk job comes from is uh, it, like has its origins in Alamigo. But it's sort of an a, a culture that more importantly, or at least more importantly to the context of Stormblood, has been under imperial rule by the Garleans for decades. And they uh and the um there's the, the name Stormblood it comes from. Uh, certain people from within the storyline, like, uh, uh, oh, why, why can't I think of his name? The, the, the form, who's the Alamegan commander in, uh, in Ulda? I, I, General Raubon? Yeah, Raubon. Wow, wow. I mentioned Raubon in a podcast a month ago, and I, and I, and I could not remember his name. Um, because Raubon resembles a character in, uh, in, uh, Radiant Historia. But, mm. uh, yeah, um, Raban is native Alamegan, and like people like him and uh, Prince Dom, uh, Prince Hien over in Doma, we'll get to him in a minute, uh, are concerned that the, the their people um, have like like not necessarily don't want to be liber- liberated, but have sort of lost their spirit after uh, after decades of Garlean rule, and and need to have like a storm of blood. They 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 need to have. Um, their souls re-energized in order to yeah. properly uh, o- overthrow the Garleans and 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 resist. And again, I, I, you could reasonably call Stormblood liberators or resistance or revolution because that's because uh, like basically um, fighting Gar- uh, the Garlean Empire and liberating those two nations is uh, key to the main storyline of Stormblood. But um, in, in you play the uh, the first couple levels. Uh, worth of content in Alamigo, sort of on the edge of the of the war front, but then um, uh, get your ass kicked unexpectedly when they when they raid the uh, uh, when the uh, Garleans raid the, um, uh, the the base at the front at the Alamegan frontier, and you decide that uh, yeah the Reach I believe is that the Reach yeah yeah um uh, Ralgar's reach is the uh yeah, is, is, is 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 the base and um it's uh like when you go there for the first time you're like oh this is going to be like a little town like an important base and uh when you're at like <laughs> after you gain one level in the storyline it gets it gets uh it, it gets attacked by the garleans and you encounter xenos the um the garlean general and the and the prince of Gar- of uh, garlemald for the first time and he is a he is a lot yeah yeah essentially when you first when you first run into him, Xenos is kind of the first, um, it's kind of the first real roadblock that the, the Warrior of Light has. You know, there's when, uh, Midgard Somer takes away the, um, you know, Heidelin's blessing for a bit and such, but this is the first physical presence that absolutely bodies you. I mean, Xenos is such an imposing figure, and this is the first time you just feel like you failed. Um, which I think is really important to the journey of the Warrior of Light to have this sort of physical presence that kind of takes away this um, steamrolling that you've done over um, countless enemies. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, it, it's think... one of those unwinnable boss fights, like when uh, the handful of times that Kane or Golbez kicks your ass in FF4. Yeah. I think um, I think Xenos being... Uh, being an unwinnable battle is like super important to setting up you, you like bringing the players' feelings on side with how the Alamegans and the Domans feel, and just how like oppressive and overwhelming any resistance the Empire has. I think it really like it really sets the tone for you know like making you feel you are part of the resistance and you you need to help these people rise up. Yeah, I- I- exactly. Like the um you, you they give you a feeling of hopelessness like uh, how on earth can we liberate Alamigo if this is what we're up against? And um we mentioned Fordola a few minutes ago. Fordola is a young Alamegan who is in the uh who, who is in the Garlean army and people like Fordola, Fordola's young, she's in her 20s, have basically known nothing but Garlean occupation. And Fordola comes from 
an angle which which you see in you know uh in in many stories about uh imperialism and historical imperial imperialism where she thinks that the best thing for the Alamegan people is compliance with Garlemald. so she uh like, like seeing an opportunity, she um, gives Xenos information that she knows about Ralgar's reach, and is and on her information is what is uh, is how the Imperial raid on Ralgar's reach takes place, which gets her, um, I, I I think promoted. Like um, she's she starts from being sort of a foot soldier to a co- to a commander of other Alamegans working for Garlemald a- after the raid. So she yeah. becomes a secondary antagonist, but is considered a traitor by the uh, by the sort of the Alamegans working in the resistance since she is a you know a by blood Alamegan um capitulating and working for Gar- Garlemald. Yeah and, and and I mean that al- that also comes from her parents because they were collaborators and they thought like oh if we you know just cooperate with the with the Garlians they'll treat us well our people will you know become valued you know citizens etc cetera, etc cetera. and um that that really stuck with her like um just the way that like her parents were treated and seen as like you know traitors and that definitely influenced her going forward like completely it's it's kind of um how i've how i've seen fordola is sort of like how we see um people who are from the non dominant socioeconomic grouping in um a nation um going into law enforcement i mean it's it's kind of how um you know like personally you know in the latino community when we see people being like no 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 we just need to get people to um feel that we're an organic part of this society and of this structure and we do that by being law enforcement and we do that by being soldiers and everything and the psychology of that oppression really just bites into you and it has you um believing these sorts of um grand schemes and wild ideas of liberation that are coming from a very, very uh, conservative and very authoritarian streak. And I think that's pretty much Fordola uh, distilled is kind of this freedom through freedom through authority through authority and capitulation to Garlemald, which uh, they're not a fan of. <laughs> yeah, and um, like it really mirrors something that I've been interested in because i'm i'm an attack on titan watcher and the latest season has been dealing with that with the character of gabby where it's like if only if only i serve my oppressors long enough i will no longer be the oppressed and it's just that hopeless like for ferdola as well it's that sort of hopeless um want to want to be recognized and accepted and be you know be part of the establishment and that that's just never going to happen for her. And also about Fordola, I think that she arrives at her views um, from a place of logic. Like, like she wants what's best for herself and other Alamegans of her, of her ilk. And she truly believes that the best option for that is, um, is, is working uh, for, for Garlemald. Like I, I, I don't, I don't think she was, born as a sort of Garlemald worshiper, but she was born in this system and thinks that, and she thinks that, uh, that, that the, the system is going to win and she wants to be on the winning team, so to speak. I I think, I think it would not take a lot for, to have Fordola be part of the resistance instead of part of the, uh, instead of part of the establishment. Like, like if things went a little differently, Fordola could be fighting alongside the warrior of light, but because of, uh, characters like Xenos and the dominance of Garlemald, she arrives at the conclusion, uh, what's best for Alamigo is working with, uh, with Garlemald, which, you know, is, is not what the, the, not what the player feels and not, not, not what anyone in the resistance feels. But I, I think that, that, uh, Fordola is like, pr- pragmatism is part of why, she, of, uh, why she, um, fights for whom she fights for. But uh, we we haven't. I mean, we mentioned Xenos and him being overwhelmingly powerful without really describing him. Uh, I mean, he's he wears the incredibly large and bulky armor of uh, of Garlean officers, which is a little bit like Judge armor from Final Fantasy XII. Uh, and he, uh, but he has like a 
I don't know, like a, like a skin crawlingly, uh, sort of tone to his voice. Like it's like, like extremely haughty, but also, uh, but, but, but also sort of just, just creepy. Um, he has hair that is way too long. That is probably wet all the time. If you, if you know what I mean. (laughs) And, uh, yeah. and he fights with a very, with a very peculiar choice of weapons. Um, apparently after he, uh, did a lot of work conquering Doma a few years earlier in the storyline, he became, uh, uh, quite fascinated by Doman weapons, the, uh, um, katana style swords. So he fights with katanas that he keeps in a multi sheath that almost looks like the barrel of a Gatling gun. Yup. And so he like he keeps three three or four or five swords in this like gun sheath that he will uh draw and replace like I I don't know like like he comes across as almost like a like, like almost like someone that is culturally appropriating from Doma in a very yes. tasteless way. Yes. He is he is a weeb. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's is a no, big he, he, weeb. He's like your he's like your weeb friend that just has an awful personality and a collection of like ten swords and like a silk <laughs> like a silk kimono in 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 quotation marks that have that has like like a giant dragon drawn over it because why not? You know that looked awesome at at the import store. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Zenos thinks he looks. Um, like the biggest, you know, the biggest, you know, bad MF in the world. But, um, I mean, to me, it's just like, uh, you know, some dude named Brad at a, at a Mexican restaurant <laughs> on Cinco de Mayo or something and being like, I'm being cultural, you know? I, I mean, ethnic food. <laughs> yeah. No, he's, he's just, he's just Raiden in Metal Gear, in Metal Gear Revengeance, uh, wearing the poncho and the sombrero and saying, I'll blend in. It's fine. <laughs> Um, I remember the first time that I saw his armor, though, uh, and just how overwrought it is. Because if if anyone's familiar with Dragon Force, uh, like the Saturn strategy RPG, he looks like he's got Junon's armor on, but he's made more room for snacks. <laughs> like there's there's just so much more compartment in that armor. He, he it is fit, like. It- it is so bulky, and yeah. it, and it, it, it's it's baffling mm. that he's able to move with speed and power in armor that size. I, I almost expect it to have, like, to, for the armor to have like like jet attachments or something, to, <laughs> uh, because because it just seems impossible to move in. And and uh, he's, and he's just see, a Gundam. He's just a yeah, Gundam. And, and when you is. see him in movement, he's often moving very slowly and laboriously, like 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 in cutscenes, mm. like he's just taking big, slow, heavy steps. But then in combat, he is. He is lightning fast, which is, you know, it, it, it's weird, but he is, uh, Xenos is a lot. He's extremely extra. And, um, after you, uh, lose badly to him at Ralgar's Reach, you decide you need to lay low. So you, uh, um, get in contact with Yugiri and Gosetsu, who are from, um, uh, who were refugees from Doma that you meet in the 2.x, uh, storylines. Uh, I, I think, I, th- I think 2.1, cause that's when, um, uh, Yugiri introduces the, the ninja job to you, which, yeah. uh, which yeah. is, is, is a, a Doman export to, uh, uh, a Realm Reborn. And that, that's when you're being a cultural appreciator, not a cultural appropriator. <laughs> um, um, we're and, letting uh, you be ninjas. We're giving yeah. you the ninja thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are giving you the ninja thing. You can do all this ninja stuff. We welcome it. Just don't be like that Xenos asshole, please. <laughs> um, but, but you decide that, uh, that, um, uh, Garibania and Alamigo are not a lost cause, but for now you should just maybe st- like avoid Xenos for a while, and maybe Doma is the place to do that. So you take a boat over to Kugane, which is a sort of a city state just outside of Doma, um, and on on the way <laughs> you do your uh, your first dungeon of um, Stormblood, and uh, we don't need to go to, in, through Stormblood dungeon by dungeon, but I think that. You know what? Maybe I do want to go through Stormblood dungeon by dungeon because I think that it does some really interesting dungeons. Um, this isn't the first time they do this in FF14, but in Stormblood, there's a lot of dungeons that are sort of, sort of different from going into a cave or a fort. Mm-hmm. It, it, like, like it, they just, it just feels, uh, 
either either setting wise or approach or approach wise um non traditional for an FF14 dungeon because the very first one is a uh, is a um basically a set of uh like like a ship's graveyard full of ghosts <laughs> because your um your boat to Kugane runs aground of them and uh, and you go through n- not a ghost ship exactly but sort of a collection of ghost ships and uh, and fight a lot of um supernatural and nautical enemies on the way through it i yeah. feel so bad that i can't remember the name of the dungeon um, um Siren Song Sea that's it Siren Song Sea it it and, reminded me um quite a bit of like Final Fantasy V and just like expansion on that whole like up to the point you're meeting Ferris. Like I feel like that ex- inspired a lot of Siren Song. Well, no, well, no um, I uh, a- 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 after you meet Ferris, um, a- a- when your uh, when your team is completed in FF5, uh, one of the first dungeons in the game after you after uh, Sildra shipwrecks, you go through a uh, a-, a network of destroyed That's ships right. and 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 fight right, and yeah, fights yeah. and fight siren at the end of it that's right yeah um, it's been so it's like, been a hot minute since i played uh, yeah. played five but yeah. oh i i it's been a while since i played ff4 or five or six but those games are just so in my dna that i can i i can relive the uh the, the plot of any of them at a moment's notice <laughs> but the but yeah like it, it is a little bit like that early ff5 dungeon and um just skipping ahead a little bit that's the six level 61 dungeon the level 63 dungeon is uh it is um uh she sweet of the violet tides which is sort of a uh, ryugyu palace um japanese folklore mm-hmm. uh um uh, taro uh, taro the fisherman um like fairy tale story or or an, a, a version of that and the level 65 dungeon is bartram's metal which is like which is on the azim step and you doing a sort of uh a, a sort of cultural sort of test of will that allows you to be part of the um of of the nadam in the uh uh, in 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 the in like to take part in sort of the 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 cultural battle uh, royale, almost. yeah, the cultural battle royale of the of the plains, and those aren't three normal dungeons. They they are they mm-hmm. are very unique to the setting and specific to the setting that you encounter each of them in, and um aren't exactly going into a cave or going into a fort in a really interesting way. And I think that um Shadowbringers has dungeons like that as well, but in in Stormblood they deliberately uh like zag instead of zig for w- what you're expecting out of a uh, ff14 expansion yeah there's a lot of interesting i i recall a lot of interesting movement things that they're that they were attempting because you know the basic dungeon the basic dungeon formula um that they worked on in realm reborn and heaven's word like it you know it works it's great there's some really amazing visuals, but on a uh, on mechanical and gameplay standpoint, it does wear a little bit thin by the time you're, um, you know, in the the um, three point X patches. And so it seems with Stormblood, they're like, okay, our engine is a little bit limited in terms of what exactly we can do gameplay wise that's going to feel all right. So let's play a little bit around with movement. Let's play a little bit around with platforming and kind of smart um, puzzling. And I really appreciate that about it because it still has these amazing aesthetics, but it also is um, kind of more engaging on terms of the spaces you have to navigate. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a boss encounter in she sweep of the violet tides that does the, uh, that, that, uh, that also borrows from that um, Taro, the fisherman, uh, story where um uh, uh, where like there's a tama- a very, basically this game's version of a tomate box where uh if if you're standing in the wrong place or open the box at the wrong time um you'll you'll get the old status and <laughs> and, right, and have to navigate right, through yeah. that but um but it, it, like through Realm Reborn Heaven's Word Stormblood Shadowbringers the FF14 team has been trying to divorce themselves of the original 1.0 engine that they've been uh, in an unhappy marriage with since the beginning of 2.0, and like and, the PS PS3 limitations for that matter. Yeah, yeah, true. But but they uh, like maybe it's more noticeable in Stormblood than Heaven's Word that they're doing things with dungeon design and boss encounter design that they couldn't do in 2.0 and 3.0, and that's where we get you know just some really creative and unusual dungeon designs and boss designs that are. That are really good. Like I, I think that I like the the Heaven's Word story more than Stormblood, speaking very broadly. But I think that F- that Stormblood has way more interesting dungeons and bosses than than uh, Realm Reborn or or Heaven's Word. And I, I'm excited to talk about my favorites of those later. But 
um, when you land in Kugane, you know, rolling, running it back a little bit, uh, Kugane is sort of the main, uh, metro- the new metropolis in, uh, in Stormblood. It's, uh, it's stylized like a, uh, l- like a feudal Japanese town. It's um, so I, I, pretty. It, it's, it's really pretty, uh, mm-hmm. and makes it very clear that this is the expansion of samurai because, uh, there's a lot, a lot of katanas, a lot of, um, sort of, uh, a, a, a traditionally Japanese, um, visual flair, and samurai is one of the two new jobs introduced in Stormblood along, alongside Red Mage. Um, but from Kugane, you go, uh, your, your, your goal is to find, uh, the Doman Resistance, and you go through an area called the Ruby Sea, which is sort of a, uh, a sort of a reef and island system that's, that's run by a group of pirates, and you, you try to get the pirates on your side. And from the Ruby Sea, you go into sort of the outskirts of Doma, where, uh, the, the, the group, where, um, the people are very much oppressed, and then you go north to this, uh, a region called the Azim Steppe, which we said earlier is, um, similar to Mongolia or other or other sort of um central asian tribe lands where uh where uh he and the prince of doma is under willful exile but yeah. more importantly in the ruby sea area you meet the governor of doma who is similar to fordola in that she is a native of doma that has been that that is working willingly with garlemald and that is yatsuyu yep and she is uh like fordola a major secondary antagonist of the game and and also, like Fordola has, we could do a whole podcast just about her, probably. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, Yotsuyu is, she is one of the key characters that brought me in and like made me care about what was happening in Stormblood. Um, like the cast is great all around, but Yotsuyu is such an excellent um, study in like how how a person's trauma can result in them becoming a sociopath. Um, and what that, like, what that means to the survival of, of, like, the, the person, um, and how, and how it reflects on how they treat others. And it's, it, it's just a really, really good piece of storytelling. Um, at least as far as 4.0 is concerned, I, I have, I have some thoughts about, uh, the continuance of Yatsuyu's storyline, but I'll save those. Yeah. I mean, Yatsuyu is a, it's a tragic figure and and yeah how they how exactly the resolution comes to it is a bit more murky and i think it's a little more hit and miss there but in terms of presenting kind of um a, a corollary and attention with fordola you know you have this character who is native you know a native of an uh of an oppressed people under the yoke of empire um where fordola is she believes in something. She is trying to make things better for the people of Alamigo. She has a funny way of going about it, but it's something that is uh, tangible. And it's not necessarily just uh, slash and burn and end things. Yatsuyu is so touched by uh, her trauma and that yoke of oppression that everything to her is just... Everything to her is just bile. It's all just things that she wants to burn, things that she wants to end, things that she wants to destroy. And it's painful to watch that at times. Um, And it's presented so well. Um, There's such a poison to the way that her voice actor presents her lines that I think is excellent. Yeah, it's, she's just like dripping in, in like almost silky venom, like everything she says is, is meant to cut at you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. And and I think that her appearance and her personality don't necessarily belie each other, but are but are uh, like 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 maybe not exactly what the player is expecting. She she resembles like a like a Japanese oiran from from three hundred years ago, like like a like yeah. like, like a like a high end uh, yakuza matriarch or 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 high end courtesan or or something. But in the very first scene you meet her, she is murdering Doman villagers almost at random. Uh, and while Fordola is trying to do what she thinks is best for her people and and has love for her country, uh, Yatsuyu almost wants revenge on her country and wants Doma to suffer. Because, uh, I, I, I hope I'm not oversimplifying this, but she was a, um, she was born into, 
uh, into Doman upper class as the child of the of a mistress of a wealth and of a wealthy Doman merchant. So, uh, but then when her mother died and she was adopted into that family, um, her mother and brother and probably also her father sort of um, did not want her, and she was and she was abused. Um, uh, I, I think both uh, both sexually and 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 socially, and 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 grew up uh, very very troubled. Putting it um, put, putting it mildly and somewhat yeah, broadly. Yeah, because she uh, was, she was like sold to a brothel at one point, wasn't she? I, I think I, th- I think so. Like she, so she was an unwanted daughter adopted by the upper class, then abused, especially by her stepmother, and then and then I think sold into a brothel and sexually abused as well. And I'm not exactly sure how she connected. With the uh, occupying Garlands, that may, may, that story probably is in there, and I just forgot it. I apologize. But uh, eventually, she um, is begins working with Doma, and is and is named Governor of Doma in Zenos's absence because Zeno was Zenos was sort of called from Doma to deal with uh, Alamigo at the at the start of the Stormblood storyline. But anyway, um, Yatsuyu is a another minor antagonist, and you sort of are first avoiding her, but, uh, but you see her in action in the Ruby sea and in the, and in the Doman outskirts, uh, but realize that the, the, the person to sort of centralize the Doman resistance around is Prince Hien, the former, uh, prince of the Doman, uh, mon- monarchy, um, or, or m- maybe you could say empire. I'm not sure. And, uh, and he's been in the Azim step for quite some time. And, uh, when you, when you meet him, it's, it's sort of interesting. You have to sort of, uh, you have to sort of meet some people around the step a little bit and learn the culture of the area. You uh, associate yourself with a uh, with a um, with a group called the Mull, who are almost a sort of one of the meeker tribes around the step. And you also meet the uh, the Oranir, the sort of more dominant tribe of uh, of, oh shoot, <laughs> what, 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 what's that race called? Um, the Aura. Yeah, the Aura. Yeah, most of the step are um, are Aura that are of a variety of a uh, of, of sort of um, of 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 a uh, sort of of a, a, a variety of phenotypes within the Aura race, <laughs> all, yeah. all around the all around the step. But yeah, the Oranir are sort of the more dominant ones at the center of the map. The Dotharal are the extra violent ones on the west side of the map, and the Mull are sort of the meek ones on the east side. And the Mull are the one you befriend. But um, in and in, in the step, there's an uh, event called the Nadam where the different tribes fight for dominance um, uh, through to the next Nadam in sort of a semi-violent uh, election of sorts. And and Hien believes that the best way to sort of gather some troops to strike back at the uh, at, at the Garleans is to win the Nadam and in doing so have the right to recruit all of the Aura in the steppe as part of the Doman resistance. So uh, you, you uh, first, to, in order to be allowed into the Nadam, you have to pat, you have to complete the Bardom's Metal Dungeon, and and that gives you a, a really dope uh, bird mount that uh, there's a lot, a lot of Aura fl- on giant flying birds in the in the middle of the Stormblood storyline, and um and 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 sort of you know uh, meeting Hien and dealing with the culture around the Azim Step is one, I think one of the most interesting parts of the Stormblood story. Uh, and this uh, section of the story was written by um, by uh, 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 oh, shoot is it, is it Naoko Ishikawa? Natsuko. Natsuko, that's it. Natsuko Ichi, um, Ishikawa, who ends up being the the main story writer for uh, for Shadowbringers. The the Azim Step. Uh, was sort of her chunk of the Stormblood storyline. And I think it's one of the most interesting. Absolutely. I mean, you have, there's so much going on in the Azim step, but first when you step onto it, there's the um, that music, the drowning in the horizon, that um, just kind of pours over you as you step in. And it's such a beautiful piece, and it kind of welcomes you to this place. And there's so much going on here in terms that's, you know, thematically resonant. There's, you know, the, there's kind of the stronger themes of um, what's going on with Hien, thinking of his duty to the nation as well as his duty to himself, um, to the smaller things like the Dotharal and how they view death in being that um, someone is always uh, reborn. And if they're reborn, they are uh, someone who was already previously existing. So if there was a, uh, a man who was, uh, or, a, you know, a male Dotharl who is, uh, wonderful with a bow, 
um, they believed that this person would be reincarnated possibly as um, possibly as a um, someone of a different gender um, or of a different sex, I suppose, in their culture, um, who might not have any natural skill with what their kind of their their previous life was skilled in. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's kind of this tension that they have between um, the traditions that they keep and um, the free will that people are allowed to exert. I I was so, uh, I I, I don't know, fascinated by the step that how they created this world that was not really any, like anything else in FF 14, but make it, but as a self-contained part of the story, is just so fascinating. Like, like, like there's one, um, and, and the different tribes sort of, um, have that sort of shared belief system and willingly take part in the, in the Nadam and, and, and naming the leader, uh, the, the leader of the step regularly, but also are just so different. The, the Oranir have this, um, are, are, are sun worshipers that have, uh, a, a, a bit of a sort of self superiority complex and the Dotharo are so violent and, um, it, it, almost the detriment of their own tri- of their own tribe as they, as they're sort of because they aren't as dominant as the Oranir, they haven't won the Nadam as many times but believe in sort of uh in in uh distingu- distinguishing themselves through battle and the important of of the importance of winning j- yeah. just so hugely that it that it, to their own suffering and i forget the name of the tribe but uh, the ones that sort of run the the mer- the mercantile area the village area near the entrance are uh are almost completely mute and and uh, and decline to speak because they believe that actions are are truth and words are lies mm-hmm. in, in in a way that that when they interact with others they they value things like um like favors and gift giving over oral communication and and, and and it's it's crazy that they created like a half dozen mini cultures as uh as sort of an an interacting multiculture that's just yeah. that's just one part of the game, and and Eva, you talked about the 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 main theme of the Azim Step it is is one of the most beautiful and striking of the whole game. I, I I've used it as opening uh, music <laughs> elsewhere in Retro Encounter before, and I enjoy it so much. Yeah, I think um, I think with like the, the the mini cultures, as you were saying, like one of the best devices they have there is that they wrote like a representative for each of them for you to actually like participate with um especially like sadu for instance and just how aggressive she is and just how you know bloodthirsty in a way yeah um, yeah i'm the, the leader of the dotharo yeah. sadu right mm-hmm. um and i can't remember the leader of the oranir's name but just like how much he looks down his nose at other people Except when it comes to um, to Ishtola, who <laughs> yeah, has it, the best <laughs> clapback in the in the universe for him. His name is Magni, and he interacts with uh, with Ishtola in the post game of Stormblood. Ishtola is remarkably absent for most of the uh, mm-hmm. Stormblood main story because she's injured in the raid on Ralgar's Reach. But uh, when um, Magni is sort of looking for his for quote unquote his son, because uh, he, he, he's looking for a prospective mate. And at, at different times, he even um, he even uh, makes advances towards the uh, the, the uh, representative in the mall, and apparently at one point tried to hit on Sadu like before the story began. And w- but when he makes uh, an advance towards Ishtola in the post game, she shuts him down spectacularly, and it's a, one of the best uh, comedy moments in all of FF14. But holy moly, how have we gone this far without even mentioning Lees? Well, I think that kind of, I think that kind of makes <laughs> sense in some way with Lise, um, because so you know just catch people up. Lise um, is from the Scions, um, and she was thought to be uh, her sister Ida. Um, turns out that she is a, a native Alamegan um, named Lise, and she is uh, kind of she's been gone from Alamigo. For so long, and uh, kind of the beginning thrust of the story is her returning to Alamigo and kind of being an outsider in um, her own in her own uh, place of birth, and how she deals with that and the um, people that she comes in contact with because she hasn't lived in Alamigo. She hasn't lived under this kind of oppressive cloud um, for decades like some of these people have. 
And so she gets angry with them. And she's like, why aren't you fighting? Why aren't you taking power back? Why aren't we setting things ablaze right now? And they kind of push her to the side a little bit because they're saying, we're tired. We are just trying to survive here. And you don't know what it's like because you weren't here. And that might have not been your fault. It might have been because of, you know, circumstances that are outside of your control. But regardless of whether it was your intention or not, you haven't been here and you don't know what it's like. And it's a lot of Lise coming to terms with that, that she can be a leader of the Alamegans, um, but she has to understand that it's kind of um, integrating herself back into her people. Yeah, and I think... um... I think one of the great points of tension for her and why she feels like why she feels she has to face up to that is she's not just an Alamegan. She's she's the daughter of Conrad Hext, who was the leader of the resistance at one point. Wait, correct. She, it, is it, no, wait. no, 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 you're right. Um, yeah, yeah, um, she, yeah, yeah, yeah. She and Ida were the are the two daughters of Conrad Hext. Um, they uh, they escaped Alamigo. Um, uh, upon her father's death, when uh, when Lise was very young, and lived either in uh, e- sorry, either elsewhere up, in a or what? Hold up, sorry, we we actually uh, need to make you combine. Just looked. You it's combine Curtis. two people. It's mm-hmm. Curtis what? Hext. Conrad Curtis Hext. Kemp is the current yes. leader. Curtis right, Hext okay. was their father. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So so yeah, but but Lise and Ida were the daughters of the previous leader of the resistance. They left Alamigo when they were both very young. Ida was a, a, at least a few years older than uh, than Lise, mm-hmm. and I uh, they they moved either elsewhere in Eorzea or maybe all the way to Charlian, where the uh, where the Scions of the Seventh Dawn are formed. But at, at some point. Um, they did join up with the Scions, and Ida became leadership within them. But at during some conflict, uh, Ida sadly po- passed away, and um, and 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 with Papalimo, um, Ida's close friend, they decide uh, they mutually decided that um, that Lise would masquerade as Ida going forward, J- uh, j- um, j- just for the benefit of the group. And but for a long time, the only person that knew. That Ida wasn't Ida and was in fact Lise was Papa Limo and maybe also Ishtola because Ishtola always seems to know things that other people don't. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's a bit of a surprise and a transformation right at the beginning of Stormblood where uh, Ida basically undergoes a costume change and says that she's actually Lise. Um, she apologizes for the deception, but uh, she did. Uh, uh, she and Papa Limo did what they believed was the best thing to do. And Papalimo sadly loses his life at the very end of the 3.5 storyline because uh, at the conflict in Balesar's Wall, right when everything explodes into the events of Stormblood, um, uh, th- that that real jerk uh, that was th- that betrays you at the end of Realm Reborn. Oh, I, uh, and and he for a while he goes by uh, the name the Griffin. Who is that? Who's that jerk? Uh, Ilbert. Ilbard, that's him. Il- Ilbard, a, a native Alamigo who wants revolution and wants violence, um, sacrifices himself and a large number of, uh, of Alamegan resistance people a- a- at the end of the Heavensward postgame to summon Shinryu, a, a primal who is a sort of a, pr- uh, a, a primeval dragon god of the, uh, of the Alamegan people. And, uh, but, and, and to, to, to combat Shinryu, um, you and Sid, and uh and and uh, uh and Nero and a bunch of people conspire to summon Omega a uh, mysterious alien life form that had landed near uh, uh Ulda many years earlier because it's the only thing you can th- it's the only being you can think of that might be able to counter Shir- Shinryu so at the at one, in one of the final cutscenes of the Heavensward post game is a really cool Shinryu versus Omega boss uh uh, uh clash that is a a, he- a hell of a cutscene um, that that ends in a draw, and has you, and then moving into Stormblood, you sort of go towards Ralgal, Ralgar's Reach for the first time, intending to fight back before uh, before Shinryu can act again. And fast forward way ahead <laughs> <laughs> to where we were last discussing discussing. Um, a- a- after you are accepted by the Mole and enter the Nadam, there's a sort of a battle royale special event. Where surprise, the Warrior of Light and T- and Hien manage to to win the big battle and recruit the uh, the, the local Aura into the Doman Resistance, and then you strike back against Yatsuryu and and uh, Doma Castle, 
which is I think the level 67 or maybe 69 dungeon. No, no, it's level 67 oh. dungeon. Um, Who then tries and, to blow up Doma on you. Correct. And, um, and, and, uh, b- because, you know, she's so uh, vindictive and evil, she would rather just, like, blow the entire town up rather than, uh, rather than concede victory. And, um, Gosetsu appears to sacrifice his life to, so that you and he and can, can escape. Gosetsu is a lar- is a large, uh, Rogadin samurai who was a retainer of Hien and, uh, who you meet many, many years earlier in the FF14 storyline in the, uh, in the, at the same time as Yugiri in the Realm Reborn postgame. Hey, he pull, he pulls his best Sabin from FF6 and just holds up collapsing Doma Castle <laughs> enough <laughs> for you to escape before it apparently crushes him and Yotsuyu. Yeah, yeah I, mean, that... I mean when he had to, when he had to do that, it was I'm pretty sure it was during a cutscene where like I need to get up and go to the bathroom. So in my game, I mean Gosetsu was holding up that holding that thing up for like ten minutes. So all <laughs> I have is really applause for him. Like pretty Oof. incredible stuff. <laughs> And that uh, that event in FF6 with Sabin and uh, I, I think Zen is the name of the city. Uh, I, I think you have about ten m- minutes of real time for him to hold up the building for you, and I still can't believe that is an optional part of the game. Yeah. Well, if you really want to, you can go all the way through to Figaro with only Celeste in your party. Although I don't know why you would want to. <laughs> um. But uh, yeah, like Sabin, Gosetsu is very large and muscular, and and uh, is able to hold up a building temporarily to have you escape. Um, eventually, and you assume that Yotsuyu also dies in the collapse. But uh, both Gosetsu and Yotsuyu do show up again later in the Stormblood storyline. Uh, but the result is you retake Doma. It's somewhat in shambles. But uh, you, you can use that as a launching point and bring your new Doman allies further west to try and retake uh, Alamigo. And the rest of the second half of the story from, oh, I don't know, around level 66 to 70 is uh, is back to Alamigo to try and, ret- and uh, retake the area. And oh, and you also recruit the Kojin to your cause, a, a, a some friendly turtle men in the Ruby Sea area. And they um, are rife with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle references. It they really great. are. Like, they, they, their, their body types resemble those of uh, Leonardo et al. And um, and uh, there's uh, Blue Kojin and Red Kojin, who are sort of the the merchants versus a, a warrior tribe of them. And uh, naturally, you're you're friends with the Blues and fight the Reds at different times. <laughs> um, they they have a, an interesting belief system centered around magical art artifacts, uh, objects of power, like the 2019 video game Control, uh, in some ways. <laughs> um, but uh, and uh, and and you fight the first um, trial battle of the game, uh, Susano, who is a a, a uh, uh may- maybe a maybe a primal maybe not but definitely a huge uh entity contained in one of the objects of power it's a, it's a pretty cool boss fight um mm-hmm. speak- speaking of holding up very heavy objects so your friends can can take the enemy down uh, there's a <laughs> one of the tanks has to hold a giant sword up in place while the while the dps work on the <laughs> boss at, at for a very dramatic pause in that uh in that battle but yeah again because barely glossing over the pirates in the Ruby Sea and the Kojin just and uh, the different tribes in the steppe, they throw so many different types of people at you in the Stormblood storyline, and we're um, we're maybe at the at the halfway or or sixty percent mark in discussing it. Yeah. Um, I think I think um, the Kojin, uh, if I can just take a second with them, they're a very interesting um, integration of like what you would see as like more Shinto. Uh, like more shrine Shinto beliefs, especially with the idea of sacred objects, because in like in Japanese imperial history, for instance, you know they have the sword, the mirror, and um, uh, there's a third object that I can't. It's it's a it's a jewel or a magatama. Right, right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the jewel, the sword, and and the mirror, and having that come forward as well with the Kojin, who also are involved with the gods of the four directions was just sort of a really cool sort of intersection of both Shinto and what I would, what I would gloss as like received Chinese traditional uh, spiritual beliefs. 
Yeah, uh, with with with, with, a, with a, yeah, yeah, with a, yeah, the the, the four lords side quest uh is yeah. which is part of the post game of Stormblood. And there's also yeah. uh, uh like like the ideas of um of reincarnation in the in the step that Eva mentioned okay. a while ago. And uh, when you go back to Alamigo and start working with the um w- w- with the the tribe of snake people there, uh, yeah. like they have some uh have have some either Hindu or pre Hindu Indian uh folk folklore, at least at a visual level, and um and and their uh um their primal that you fight at one point around level level sixty eight or sixty nine section of the storyline is um Lakshmi. Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is Lakshmi, which is again a uh a, a, a goddess from uh from from Hindu folklore. And it it's it, there's just such a mishmash and intersection of cultural influences in Stormblood that's that's always fascinating. Um the Four Lords storyline is tied for my favorite special special event or, or special quest line in Stormblood. We'll get to what the other one of those is uh a little later, but um but but when you return to Alamigo, you interact with the uh uh, with the resistance again and stage a new offensive against Alamigo. You go into the final area of the game, which is a, a part of Garabania called the Locks. Uh, you go through a dungeon that is, uh, that is extremely Final Fantasy VI Magitech Lab. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and then the final dungeon of the game is retaking the, 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 the palace of Alamigo and, and finally fighting Xenos once and then, Sh- and then Shinryu in a separate trial. Al Amigo, which is enormous, like just, just mind boggling huge. huge. Yeah, just just like I I I, I was back in Alamigo the other day, and I was just like, I forgot how big this place is. Like they really put giant structure on display there. And it was really cool. Like I I really love the scale they introduced. And the dungeon before it, you're fighting a bunch of like lab monsters in FF uh, from FF6, and and I think the uh, one of, the final boss of it is one of the mag rotor enemies from FF6. Yep. Uh, and Al- Alamigo is full of uh, Garlean technology, which again resembles FF6 Magitech. Uh, and and Shinryu, the um, the final boss of Stormblood, a an, another primal trial battle, is uh, is you know from the super boss from Final Fantasy V. Uh, just in case you had thought you thought that uh, FF14 wasn't done making <laughs> classic Final Fantasy references, uh, just hold on to your butts. Um, but the the, the post game of or no no the, the end game of uh, Stormblood ends in another uh, a final moment of uh, sort of imperialism. Uh, again, we, we we've talked about the different feelings of characters like Lys and Fordola and Yatsuyu, and 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 how sort of imperial occupation and uh, and an invading force has affected each of them. Uh, they do one thing at the very end of Stormblood that I thought was really powerful uh, throughout the uh, throughout the game. There's sort of a, a a chanted anthem that plays during boss fights, and you see and you hear a version of it being sung by uh, by imperial troops when you when you're uh, when you're going through the Alamegan uh, occupied areas of the game, and, and and you think of it as like oh this is an imperial marching song or or this is maybe the Garlean national anthem, or or or, or similar you, you you could reasonably think that, but at the very end of the story. With Xenos defeated and Shinryu defeated, and members of the resistance coming up to the, the the castle ramparts of the Alamigo capital, and they all begin to sing it together, but with with a slightly different tone and different lyrics than the marching song you heard before, and you, and the player realizes, oh, the invading Garleans took the national anthem of Alamigo, rewrote it into an imperial marching song. In order to in order to integrate the uh, like native Alamegan culture and make it become Garlean culture, and this is something that the British Army did in India and other places with some traditional music, and and um, and and certainly other um, sort of it, like imperialist forces over the course of, of real human history. But just the the moment of realizing that uh, the Alamegans taking back Alamigo sort of com- like comes to a head with them taking back their own song in, in a way that just was a-, a really powerful moment for me that that yeah. that is a that that's sort of right at the beginning of the end credits of Stormblood. Yeah, it's it, like when that happens, I remember just feeling like this is 
this is the most complete that FF14 has felt to me in terms of like summarizing its story thesis. This is this is a powerful moment. Um, you know, visually of course and 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 plot-wise, but having that song there to tie it all together and be like this is this is what resistance against imperialism actually means in the story. And 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 it being so emotionally powerful was just wonderful to me. Yeah, and there's um and how this works, it's kind of like this representation of the extracting of uh, the extracting practices of imperial forces. And you know, it's not just, you know, taking swords and cultural appropriation. Um it's taking away the very essence of what makes a uh, a group of people um a people. And so you have the song being taken from them and you have their culture being taken away. You have um, all of these different facets that are just kind of being stripped away and taken for use by that colonizing force. And it makes you um, um, ignorant and not of your own accord, of your own identity and um, where exactly you fit into this sort of structure. And it also kind of works with how the Garleans, um, they can't use... Um, they basically have to rely on others for the echo. They have to have an artificial echo um, called the resonant, which um, is basically, it reminds me of this idea that like, oh, this, this imperial force, we don't have magic, but the people where um, the people that we are oppressing, they do. We need to take their magic because we have none. We are dull and they are the colors. Yeah. And, and and so they experiment on natives to create this artificial echo called the resonance. And um, Fordola and Xenos, uh, I think Fordola as a guinea pig and Xenos later, both uh, are experimented on to gain the resonance for themselves, yeah. uh, w w which makes the boss fights against them, you know, uh, not not more complicated, but just just adds a, a plot wrinkle to when you um fight them as uh when you fight them a second time. Yeah, because you. Because usually you'd, you'd fight Garlean, uh, if, you, if you fought Garleans, you've mostly had to deal, at least visually, with the, with the like, technology they possess. But Xenos is a whole other, a, a whole other bag of tricks. Yeah, he, he wants to appropriate everything he can from the a Eorzean residents to Doman Katanas. <laughs> uh, and, uh, again, Xenos is just a lot to deal with in general. And, but, uh... In in the post game of uh, Stormblood, there, there's a lot more to deal with um, the, uh, the 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 snake people in an attempt to uh, t to reclaim parts of Alamigo, summon uh, Lakshmi again, and 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 try to uh, and and try to ensorcel all of the leadership in the, in New Alamigo that doesn't have that doesn't have the resonance or the or the uh, or the echo uh, in a a, a sort of a really interesting choice. Um, Lee uh, willingly frees Fordola so she can help fight back against Lakshmi because with the resonance, uh, Fordola is able to resist uh, Lakshmi's control, which is a, a, a weird mini game of a boss fight where you have to sort of uh, l l like uh, uh, prevent the enemy soldiers from reaching the the trapped council <laughs> people, yeah. so so they so they don't become entranced. It's a it's it's, it's a weird one, but it, 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 uh, the story significance of it is that uh, the you know a council of Alamigo is able to reform and uh Fordola is freed from prison then willingly returns to prison because uh, because she feels I, I think Fordola feels a real sense of um of, of wanting to repent after everything that's happened even even though even though she was you know part of the oppressing force uh she she she, she concedes in a way that felt like a a sincere attempt of uh, of of forgiving her character. It's kind of like she was leading this one woman army, and you know, just kind of completely suffused with her own ideology and way of going about liberation. And she, once she realizes that liberation is um, within their fingertips for the Alamegans, and you know, is they're actively working towards setting up this council and reestablishing Alamigo as a free place. Um, I'm sure she feels defeated because her ideology and her idea of capitulation and essentially surrender to the Garleans in order to win liberation has completely failed. 
And and earlier in the story, um, her unit is wiped out by Xenos uh, willingly, uh, sort of as a sacrifice, in, in an attempt to try and take down uh, the Warrior of Light and his and and, and their team. Um, around the level 68 or 69 section of the story. So, and, and I think that was sort of her, a wake up call to Fordola that after you defeat her, she sort of, she accepts defeat, not necessarily gracefully, but in, in a way that sort of, I think, fits her pragmatic character and fits her character that, that wants the best or at least wants good for El Amigo. Um, but, uh, who, someone, a character that has a bit of more of a awkward reclamation project, I think, is Yatsuyu, who is, uh, yeah, who is um in the it's in the the four point two or four point three patch I think you learn that Yatsuyu and Gosetsu survived the explosion at Doma Castle, uh and Go- Gosetsu is badly injured but uh, but in in you know in possession of his mental fa- faculties but Yatsuyu has complete amnesia of everything that's happened and I th- I think she goes by Yatsu. Just now? sue you, sue you, S- sue you. That's what it is. Yeah, it's been it's been two years <laughs> since I since I played Stormblood, so I'm definitely getting names wrong all over the place. Uh, but there's a whole section of the story where sue you um, is, is like is is very innocent, almost like almost heartbreakingly so. Uh, she wants nothing more than to help Gosetsu, who who she's aware uh, rescued her uh, and and wants and wants to take care of him, uh, but. But, like, when she goes out in public, the Domans remember her as their bloodthirsty governess and, uh, and, like, are practically throwing rocks at her in the, in the street when she just tries to go and, and buy a, and buy a persimmon from a local market. You, um, you'd think that Gosetsu would have at least told her, uh, maybe we should cut your hair or something. You're really easy right? to pick out. No, no, they gave her a hat. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. It's, it's 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 the perfect disguise. They yeah. ba- like they did the equivalent of giving um of giving Yotsu um like Groucho Marx glasses, and they're like, <laughs> this should be fine. Like I they won't have, even know. I would have loved if that had been a gag where she just like she's at some peddler's stall and turns around, hey Gosetsu, and just has the big nose and and mustache and <laughs> thick rimmed glasses on. Like, yeah, she's that I mean and, and and because she has long straight black hair that a little bit reminds me of Yukiko putting on the 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 f- silly glasses in Persona 4. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just a little bit um uh, the, that visual image which does not happen in FF14 but now I sort of wish it did. Uh but mm-hmm. but anyway um uh and Yatsu even reconnects with her uh w- with her half brother who was um who was working for the uh, uh. The, the, the Garlemald forces as well uh, As- Asahi I hate who's him. A, who's a real he's a real jerk butt that Asahi. I hate Asahi so much. There is there is from the moment he's on screen just being sort of like the hand rubbing uh yes, I'm you know, I'm so I'm so glad that we can come to arrangements just like this slimy snake of a politician. And uh, Yeah, it it's it, it's it's clear that he wants to be the new governor of Doma and like reintroduce uh uh Garlean rule there, because that that yeah. would be his path to victory, which is which, you know, immediately uh <laughs> ingratiates you him to the player, of course. And and then the then the heel turn. An extremely obvious heel turn. But where I, I think is he instrumental in um in giving Yatsuyu the uh, the object of power that turns her into Tsukiyomi, right? Yeah. So I mean, he kind of sets all these things, in he kind of sets all these things in place. And his plan to um his plan basically goes all uh swimmingly until the very end when he is killed by his uh, half sister Yatsuyu. So yeah. And Mark, you were talking about the uh, the three treasures of Japan, the Imperial Regalia. Where I, I think the Magatama jewel be, like summons Susano earlier in the story, mm-hmm. and I believe it's the, the a, a mirror. Uh, like, isn't it a mirror that that turns Yatsuyu into Tsukiyomi? Yeah, it's uh, it's like a stone mirror essentially that has has mm-hmm. like the moon carved into it. Right, and 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 that's a a trial boss battle in the uh, the Stormblood post game. It's a, it's a pretty cool fight also mm-hmm. where you have to you know like a uh, switch between um switch between uh, like like black areas and white areas of the map based on her attack patterns like you're playing ikaruga or something yeah <laughs> but it's a uh it, it's, a, it's a really cool boss fight with a with a really banging soundtrack too it, it's also like really um a, a, a bit of a prophetic boss battle in terms of 
these kinds of mechanics are about to become a lot more common in Final Fantasy XIV. Like, yes. Yeah. It, the <laughs> boss fights become puzzles in Stormblood, and the Tsukiyomi fight is a is emblematic of that. But uh, we're into the post game of Stormblood now. Uh, I, I would be remiss if we don't talk about the Four Lords trials, or the Return to Evilise uh, Alliance raids, or the Omega raids. Uh, the Four Lords trials are, are is basically a side quest of two dungeons and three trial boss fights that are you know somewhat steeped in uh, in adapted Chinese folklore. Uh, you you fight the the four um, gods of the cardinal directions um, as bosses, as well as a version of uh, Sun Wukong, the Monkey King. And in in uh, in the uh, in the Swallows Compass uh, yeah. dungeon, which is one of my favorite dungeons in the whole of FF14, um, and that's a really really cool uh, boss fight. And I, and I think those versions of Byako, Suzaku, uh, Seiryu, and Genbu are from Final Fantasy XI. Uh, there was a, uh, a those bosses show up in that game in a in a similar manner, uh, although not exactly the same one, uh, which is you know. Uh, Again, it's 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 from Chinese folklore, but also a reference to FF11. Those yeah. those bosses, yeah. um, the the regular trial series is Omega, that um, robot from the uh, from before Stormblood, in in which he captures a num the Warrior of Light and a number of your allies, and has you undergo trials to determine what the strongest life form is, <laughs> which yeah. is basically fighting a bunch of bosses from Final Fantasy five, six, VI, and one. Um, before uh, before fighting Omega th- um, themselves, it, it, that's a that's a weird one. So Omega was a really cool thing. Even I actually got to do this this uh, end uh, end of Omega together. And up until up until basically near the end, um, I know for me it had just been kind of like take it or leave it. And I think Eva, you felt pretty much the same way. Like yeah, Ome- Omega wasn't super inspiring. It was fine. And then they pull out this design from, um, <laughs> oh my god, from Yoshi Omega Tata M and Mono Omega for oh Omega my Omega god. M and Omega F, yeah. yeah. <gasps> and, and it is it is just like I've never seen Amano's work rendered in 3D that well. It's so slick. Um, uh, l- listeners, if you're unfamiliar, um, after you battle Omega successfully, Omega concludes that the strongest life form is, in fact, the Warrior of Light. And they adapt that idea into summoning two versions of itself, Omega M and Omega F, basically hyper stylized, humanoid, uh, robotic. Uh, versions of Omega in in the final battle of the Omega raids, ba- basically two Amano as hell semi robotic humanoids. Yeah, a little, that a little are T one thousand going on with them. Yeah, 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 way too pretty, and um, <laughs> and basically the a Omega's interpretation of what the of what a male and female warrior of light are again Omega M, Omega F. Yeah, or what they're called. Look up those character designs if you're not familiar with them because they are something. They're it's they're I mean they're so gorgeous. I am. I am completely in love with those designs. Some of my favorite, um, some of my favorite things from a visual standpoint that I've seen in FF14, uh, and it's and yeah, Omega, the Omega Escape, and everything. It's fine. It's cool. You fight Kafka. There's you know whatever. But then when you get to that, I think it was a wonderful end. And then you get the um, Omega minion and the. Um, Alpha, Alpha minion. minion, yeah, and it's like, yes, I want these. I wanted these so bad, and I was <laughs> so happy when we got them. Yeah. You know, and now I just have a little Omega or a little Alpha following me around everywhere. It's and I, great. Al- Al- I, Alpha being the the cartoon Chocobo from the most recent Chocobo's Dungeon game, yes. uh, who, who's yeah. sort of your guide through the Omega raids. He's he's very cute. I, very good boy. I love how successfully they managed to pull Chocobo's Mysterious Dungeon art style into Final Fantasy fourteen, and then also bring Omega's super Amano artwork, and it just feels weirdly cohesive. And it's fine. It's fine. This is fine. I don't know. You've put Bugs Bunny next to, like, the works of Ralph Bakshi, but somehow that's working for me. It's cool. <laughs> and, and speaking of other character designers entering Stormblood, the Return to Evilly storyline... Um, yes. it incorporates a lot of FF12 and FF tactics into uh, into three giant raids, and uh, in the context of um, the story of FF tactics and and Ramza and some such being a uh, 
being a, a, a like a, a series, uh, 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 some ancient Rabinastra history, right? That being an, an area that's that was taken over by Garlemald a long time ago, and a playwright who believes himself to be a descendant of Ramza, sort of writing plays critical of the Garlemald Empire while trying to find evidence of the ruins of this of this um of this fa- of this famous story. Who looks uh, like so, Ramza? Let us be clear. Yeah, he looks like yeah. Ramza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I mean, it's it, it's it's his it's Ramza's father is was the character, but yeah. uh, but his son Ramza it, it enlists you to try and locate his missing father, and uh, over the course of the dungeons, you realize the truth of that uh, of that story. Um, you inter you interact with uh, with the FF fourteen version of of new Ramza and new Alma, and uh, and fight a series of bosses that are um, based on FF twelve and FF tactics characters that are incredible like Mm -hmm. again some of them are are sort of bosses in puzzle form you have to do some algebra to defeat worker seven new (laughs) um or i actually construct seven new i think i think is what they're what he's called in this game Mm -hmm. um there's uh i don't know tank switching and and platform switching in the orlando uh war god boss fight that uh definitely messed me up the first couple times i tried it (laughs) don't yeah yeah yeah, don't don't try tanking that one without watch yeah don't try tanking that one without watching a video first let me tell you And um, uh, you you fight Mecha Sniper Mustadio, which was a trip. Uh, but it, like it, it uh, w- without going over every plot point in that uh, Alliance Raid series, maybe the coolest like Final Fantasy referential content in all of FF14. <laughs> it's like, like uh, if you have any appreciation for FF12 and or FF Tactics, you need to play those or, because they are breathtaking i uh, like like for, i love four lords for the boss fights and the designs and i love ivalice for basically everything in the in in stormblood and it's really cool that they you know they had yasumi matsuno the creator of um you know ivalice um working on this because he's a huge ff14 player and um and he was you know basically he pitched this to um to Yoshi P and Yoshi P was like, dude, I love your work so much. Let's do yeah, this. Y- y- Yoshi P even made a tactics ogre super dungeon in realm in uh, around the heavens word time. Right. Uh, it's- uh, it's, so, so you, they were fans of each other and having them work together for return to evil East was a match made in heaven. It's amazing. I, yeah, I completely share your sentiment on it. It's wonderful. Um, I mean, my, <laughs> I, I love, uh, evilly so much and it's kind of a joke if anyone knows me about it um but these these three duties that they have in it for the alliance raids the royal city of Ravanaster, right around a lighthouse and orbo monastery we'll get into them i think a little um in just a second but breathtaking yeah you said it best yeah uh, I, I don't think we will get into the specifics of them in just a second because we are, are near the end of where we need to reach the podcast. But but, but before we close things off, I do want to ask, uh, basically as a reflection of your tastes and preferences, uh, tell me your favorite piece of Final Fantasy content within Stormblood, your favorite piece of FF14 content outside of Stormblood, and what your sort of main job is. Because I, I don't think we mentioned that when we were talking about our Final Fantasy journeys before. Uh, I, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I love the Swallow's Compass dungeon in the, in the Four Lords story time, uh, story time, storyline, <laughs> where you, where you fight, uh, where you fight the Monkey King boss at the end. Uh, everyone know, I've mentioned many times that I, my sort of co-main jobs are Monk and Warrior, but I also dabble in, in Samurai and Gunbreaker a lot, especially because they use, um, the, the, a lot of the same equipment as Warrior and Monk. And, uh, I, I don't know. Um, uh, we aren't going to get to it quite yet, but my I still think my favorite dungeon or the the dungeon in Greater FF14 that I, is maybe the most remem- memorable to me is Holdminster Switch. The first dungeon of Shadowbringers is is very very special to me. But uh, I won't go into the specific, specifics of those. But I will let both of you go into specifics if you like. Um, uh, starting with you, Mark, can you give me your uh, your uh, your your personal main job? One of your favorite pieces of FF of Stormblood content, and one of your favorite pieces of FF14 content, not Stormblood. It, it would uh, whatever order you choose. Um. So like I I mained Monk for most of of 14. Um. More and more I am playing Astrologian. Um. So but I switched between the two. I played Dark for a little bit. I played Samurai for a little bit. They, you know, like I I can go back to them. They're they're not my main interest. 
Um, in terms of my favorite piece of Stormblood content, I would say probably Hell's Cure, which was part of the Four Lords quest. It's the battle against Suzaku. The, you got to play a rhythm game for that one. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, you have to. You have to make sure that you aren't in the way of that fire. <laughs> um, but I like what struck me about that uh, is that the mechanics are really solid, and Suzaku herself is gorgeous. One of my favorite designs in all of Final Fantasy XIV. Um, there's a bit of Chinese in there. There's there's strangely like a little bit of like Indian influence in there, and it's it's just so colorful and rich. And I, I just really love how she looks in her like humanoid form. Um, and then in terms of like larger content, it's sort of a throw like it's, it's sort of a toss up between Gimlet Dark, um, which is the end of Stormblood, and um, the fight against Valtry. Um, and just like how his dungeon looks in Shadowbringers. Um, Gimlet Dark just being so alive and rich with like explosions and soldiers and and events essentially and like and fighting alongside these characters that you've come up in the story with in a really nice procedural scenario. Um, Val 3 doesn't exactly have a dungeon. I mean, you do do the Mount Gulg dungeon right before him. Yeah, that's that's the one I mean, Mount Gulg. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah but but uh, but the actual fight against him is a trial called Innocence, which is a super, super cool trial in Shadowbringers. That, yeah. that, that fight rules. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Eva, can you uh, share some favorites with us? Sure. Um, so, um, also keeping on the Four Lords, um, Jade Stoa, um, which is Biako's uh Biakos trial. Um, it's a very strange trial, but it's also got probably my f- probably my favorite piece of music from Storeblood, which is uh, Amatsukaze. Just just a riff and song. Just absolutely. <laughs> I think I, I think I also used that for a previous retro encounter episode. Oh, at one point. <laughs> it's it's so good. It just rips. Um, and then I mean the Evilly stuff. I was I was saying oh we can come back to that because. Uh, or Bon or Ridorana. I mean, if you let me fight, um, if you let me fight Mateus or, uh, Construct Seven, um, or Yasmet, I'm very, very happy. And, um, a lot of my favorite stuff is just in Stormblood. You know, Shisui as well. Um, and, um, I. Shisui is, be- such, a, is such a beautiful dungeon. Holy moly. Uh, yeah. I mean, it is so, it is just brilliant. I love it. And, and, and people are always trying to farm that uh, that the uh, the very risque uh, uh, female armor in Shisui Violet Tide. So the, there's all like it, it comes up in the in the dungeon roulette quite often. <laughs> yeah, I've never been about that because my characters just wear like hoodies and such. Um, but um, I am a mechanist. I started off as a summoner until somewhere in Heaven's Word, and then as soon as I was able to unlock mechanist, I was like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, if we're doing this, because I I love being working class shooty girl. Like that's that's just that's just all I am, and ever all I ever want to be. So yeah, yeah. Sometimes you you find a job and it just feels like home. Yes. Uh, like I, again, I I started as a monk in FF14, but then when I got over tanking anxiety and started experimenting with tanks, I realized oh, giant axe warrior is who I am now, and <laughs> it, it, it's been my it's been my main my main since. I don't know something with level twenty five content in the uh, um, in my FF fourteen career, it's Monster but, Hunter. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. They, they, uh, remarkably, um, the switch axe is almost closer to a katana than a than a than a heavy axe. I mean, that's, I mean, mon- yeah. Monster Hunter great swords are kind of more like a, a warrior axe. But the, Stormblood is the expansion that had a, that has a Monster <laughs> Hunter trial in it. You get to fight a Rathalos. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and in the very hard version of it, yet yeah, they incorporate some Monster Hunter rules like uh, three deaths and you get a game over, and uh, a team of four instead of a team of eight. And and, and the the mon- one of the Monster Hunter producers, who I think is a grandson of the fa- founder of Capcom, uh, like w- was brought in uh, for the uh, for this crossover. And and he even talked about in an E3 conference once he talked about trying to uh, recruit Yoshi P over to Capcom and, and convincing him that revitalizing FF14 was a mistake. 
<laughs> which wow. is a, yeah, wow. a story from something like 2011 or 2012 that they were, they, that they can, that they could laugh about it, la- laugh about in 2017 in the, in that interview that I've, that I saw. But, uh, the result of that crossover was the Rathalos trial in FF14 and a behemoth hunt, a, a Final Fantasy behemoth hunt in Monster Hunter World. Uh, that, uh, that is an extremely cool crossover that you bet your ass I, I took part in. <laughs> But uh, speaking of crossovers that I take part in, let's talk about uh, what's coming else. What's coming up in Retro Encounter, um, uh, listeners? In April, we are finally doing an episode on Crimson Shroud that I have delayed multiple times uh, over the pa- uh, over the past week, uh, few weeks or month, uh, to the frustration of Eva and others. But we are going to do an ep- our episode on Crimson Shroud next week, so I better finish that game before next week i guess but um, after crimson shroud we are doing uh, two episodes on sweet and three another game that i have barely started and need to and need to play much more of in the coming weeks um but uh we will get to that our third sweet and game for the retro encounter podcast later in april and coming in may we are doing our special dragon quest month to separate the to well, separate to celebrate the 35th anniversary of dragon quest um I'm also 35. I am somewhat tickled to be a few months older than my favorite RPG series. But we're doing four episodes on Dragon Quest, um, two of which are going to be game journals about Dragon Quest IV, um, the youngest or second youngest game, I'm, I'm sorry, the oldest or second oldest game that we've ever played for the podcast. So we've only gone into the NES days one other time. So Dragon Quest IV and two other Dragon Quest episodes coming in May. But uh, whether you listen to us in April or May or any time at all, the best way to reach us is to email retro at rpgfan.com. You can also visit rpgfan.com's message boards or our Facebook page or our Instagram or our Twitter or our Discord or our YouTube channel or our Twitch channel, something streaming on Twitch basically every day. There are many ways to interact with RPG Fan. Please do whichever uh, is your favorite, even if it's just listening to these podcasts. And I say these podcasts because there are three other podcasts on retro um, woo, on RPG Fan. Not on retro. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm mixing up my words today. This is embarrassing. But uh, not embarrassing are our three other podcasts. Random Encounter about randomness, Rhythm Encounter about RPG music, and Phoenix Edge, another weekly podcast mostly focused on current events. You can review Retro Encounter or those three other podcasts on iTunes or Google Play or Spotify or however you choose to listen to us. Please listen to us, whatever you, uh, whatever is your um, preference. But if you prefer to interact with the three of us individually on social media, let's tell the listeners how to do so, starting with you, Eva. So if you want to send me cute pictures of Yasumi Matsuno, uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram as at Eva Lise, or you can find me, I know, uh, <laughs> or you can find uh, me on RPG Fans General Social Media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And Mark, how can listeners interact with you? Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at pseudo March S U D O M A R C H. Um, and you can send me cute pictures of Hien or you Oh, uh, you know, either one's good. And listeners, if you want to interact with me on social media, you probably figured out how to do so by now. You can find me at the real monsoon. Most of the time at evoker for dogs, other times monsoon Mike on RPG fans discord. And I will accept any cute pictures of Gosetsu that you can provide. Um, <laughs> But uh, li- listeners, no matter who you think is cutest in Stormblood, uh, it is a remarkable achievement within Final Fantasy XIV, and I had a blast reliving it and discussing it with Eva and Mark. Uh, but uh, to Eva and Mark and the listeners, thank you, good night, Bye. and good luck. <laughs>